Okay, uh, welcome to this uh, special colloquium of circular astrophysics. Uh, thank you for showing up on this uh, hot summer day. And uh, so, since our uh, today's speaker, Orko Balanji, is a long term collaborator of our colleague, Dr. Sujatana Jarati, so I uh, give her the, the responsibility to introduce our speaker. Thank you so much, Nitubal. Um, I think Arco doesn't need much introduction because majority of the audience have been introduced to Arco before when he gave this gave the, the special colloquium in December 2022. Uh, but anyone who ever sees Arco never forgets. That's true. Right? That's a fantastic <laughs> talk, and people were like looking at me saying, "Man, this is a, a smaller discussion." Oh, fantastic! But anyway, so uh, Arco was an undergraduate student at a St. Stephen's College. Before that, he was at Don Bosco Professors, right? And, uh, and I have heard from multiple sources that he was a phenomenal student at St. Stephen's, uh, one of the best in many years. And then he went to TIFR for his integrated PhD, but took his master's, got his master's degree from there. And three years later, he went to UIUC for his PhD. And he worked with uh, Professor Neil Dallal, uh, on cosmological, actually cosmology, and particularly structure formation to be more specific. He was a uh, postdoctoral post fellow at Stanford University, and we are so uh, happy uh, to have him as uh, one of our young and bright faculty member in the Indian fraternity, and Orko has joined uh, ISAR in 2021. Two. Two, right, 2022. Uh, and he has been leading a big group there, working with young students, and also a very vibrant member of the community, community itself. And we are very glad to have Oracle here. And uh, one of our former students, Joy Bhattacharya, uh, so uh, Oracle and particularly more Sushmita, who's, who's uh, <laughs> should I have to interview you? I said Shushmita has to now give a talk. She was a speaker a few years back in the physics department. That was, I think, before they came, came to India. So, but uh, with Shushmita and Arco, uh, Joy actually wrote, uh, did his master's thesis. And so I don't know if it's a long term collaboration, but yeah, it's a few years collaboration. And uh, great. So, okay. without any further delay, Arco, please. Okay, thank you, Suchatunda and Nitoban, for hosting me. Uh, Wonderful to be back here again. Uh, so today I will talk about something that if any of you attended my last talk was the end of my last talk, yes. which is something that I've been working on for the past few years. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, the role of summary statistics in cosmology and how this is a crucial question in extracting as much information as we can from all the cosmological surveys that are happening. Okay, so we are entering a new era in cosmological data. So across various frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum, we are mapping out the universe in greater and greater detail. So from the cosmic microwave uh, observations, we can see the universe, uh, a snapshot of the universe when it was very young. The perturbations in the universe were very small. And then we can see all the way down to low redshifts where Gravitation, gravitational collapse has driven much of the structure to become nonlinear, forming galaxies that you see here. So this is from the DES survey. You can see all the bright galaxies here. This is from the DESI survey. Uh, many of you may have heard of the DESI survey. Each point here is actually a galaxy for which the spectrum has been measured. This is from the dark energy survey. This is a representation of the weak lensing mass map. So it tells you about how the mass in the universe is distributed between redshifts of 0.2 and 1.3. Okay. But this is what typically data from cosmology looks like. Either you have maps okay, where you are looking at data that is supposed to be continuous. So for this, for example, this one and this one, or they are a set of discrete objects like galaxy positions, okay, like this. 
And now we are moving beyond the electromagnetic spectrum. So we can see the universe in gravitational waves. So this is actually a map of uh, the universe as seen in terms of binary black hole merger events. Since LIGO does not have very good localization, these are not points like you would see in optical surface, but they constitute these large bananas on the sky, which tells you the probable locations from which these blind, binary black holes at which these binary black holes merge. So all of this is allowing us to see the universe in more and more detail. Now, what we want to do is we want to utilize this data that we are seeing. So either maps or discrete sets of points. We want to somehow use this data to answer the fundamental questions in cosmology. This might be done from one map. This might be done by combining different maps. So these are called cross correlations. But either way, using the data from these maps, we want to answer questions like what happened in the early universe? What drove inflation? What makes up uh, the universe today? What is dark matter? Can we measure the mass of the neutrino? What is dark energy? Is it consistent with being a cosmological constant? Recently, there was a flutter because of the DESI collaboration in its first data release said that if you open up a certain parameterization called W not WA for dark energy, dark energy is not consistent from their data at least with being the cosmological constant. Okay, so now this opens up Pandora's box. So you have a lot of fundamental questions that you're trying to answer. And also, this is actually intimately tied up with the physics of galaxy formation and astrophysics. Okay, you can't really disentangle cosmology and astrophysics completely. So these are the questions that we want to answer. To do this, we have to be able to make theoretical predictions. But in cosmology, we are solving what is called the inverse problem. We measure something, there is data. We are trying to figure out which model gives us the best fit for that data. Okay, in very layman terms, that is what we are trying to So, on the theory side, we develop models, we make predictions for the observables from that model and compute what matches best with the data. But the models themselves can have free parameters. As you vary the parameters, the output of your model will change. And so you have to be able to compute these theoretical predictions for a whole range of values. Now, these calculations could either be semi-analytic calculations or n-body simulations. Okay. So maybe some of you are familiar with these things. This is, for example, a map of the density perturbations of the universe as produced by simulations. In this particular paper, this is quite old. At that point, lambda CDM or the presence of dark energy had not been fully established. So people also looked at what was called SCDM, which is standard CDM, which has no dark energy. All the universe is made up of matter. So they're scanning different models. And as you can see, as the universe evolves, so redshift of three is the farthest away, redshift of zero is today. As the universe evolves, evolves you see slightly different patterns as the outputs of these different models. So in principle, you can compare this with data, or you could have compared this with data in the late 90s, and you could have come to the conclusion that lambda CDN is the preferred model. Okay. Actually, I am not entirely sure. People with more experience might be able to shed more light on this. Yeah, tau CDM, I think, is the, tau is the uh, dark matter. So this will be a slightly warmish dark matter cosmology, but I, I don't know what to see here. Okay. So that so the last slide uh, showed us what happens when we change the model. But within the model, you can change the parameters of the model. So within lambda CDM, I can try a model which has a lot of dark matter. And I can try a model which is less dark matter. So omega matters for those of you who are familiar with that terminology. So if I have a lot of dark matter, you see these bright spots. Again, I'm what this plot is showing is, is the density distribution of dark matter. The bright spots you see, you can imagine them to be the galaxies. Okay? So if you have a lot of dark matter, you will see lots of galaxies. Okay? If you have less dark matter, only a few of the most massive objects, these are called dark matter payloads, will light up in galaxies. Okay, 
So again, by comparing to data, you'd be able to fit not only the model, but the parameters of the model. So this idea of comparing data and simulations is extremely crucial for us to actually extract useful information from cosmological survey. So this is my simulation. I need some way of comparing this to what I am measuring, either in the form of continuous maps or as a set of discrete objects. Okay. So that is what we are going to discuss in the rest of the talk. Now, how would you compare those two? Maybe the simplest idea is to compare pixel by pixel. Okay. If my simulation says that, okay, there should be a value of five here, do I measure the value of five at the same place in the universe? While this sounds the simplest, it is actually not feasible. Okay. Because what we measure is one part of the universe. Now you could actually get all your model and parameter values correct. But just because you're looking at this patch of the universe and not that patch, your simulation may not match the values here, but it might have been a perfectly good match for that value there. So pixel by pixel comparison is not going to solve the problem. What you want to do is you want to statistically summarize the information that lives inside these maps or set of objects. Now, these summary statistics should be computable from both the data and the theory set. And then we try to match them at the level of that summary statistics. Okay. I'll come to what summary statistics are. But these summary statistics that's trying to capture all the information in these uh, data sets should try to capture as much of the information about the distribution of the data as possible. Now, a summary statistic can be anything. You can say, what is the mean uh, luminosity of all these galaxies in this data? That is also a summary statistic, but it may not be a very informative summary of the data. So we will try to talk about informative summary of the data. Yeah. Why you want them to be informative is because the stronger or the more informative the summary statistic is, then using the same data, you'll be able to constrain your theories much better. Okay. The stronger the information content in the summary statistic, the better constraints you get on your theory models. So as I showed you, uh, the data in cosmology can appear either in the form of continuous maps or a set of discrete points like the positions of galaxies. In today's talk, we'll focus a little more on the discrete data. So for the discrete data, at its most abstract level, the question we are really asking is what is the optimal way to characterize the distribution of a set of points, either in 2D, because if you have projections, it's in 2D, or if you have 3D data like uh, a spectroscopic survey in 3D, what is the optimal way to characterize the distribution of a set of points? You are just given a set of points. How do I capture the information in this? That is basically the question we will try to answer. Now, for many years in cosmology, the way this is being done is to use the two-point correlation function. Okay. So what is the two-point correlation function? You take your data, you choose a scale R, you find out all the pairs that are separated by distance R or R plus minus dr, okay, some small epsilon point. You get some number of pairs, you compare that to the number of pairs you would get if you threw down equal number of points completely randomly over the same volume. Okay. You do this for one hour, then you change your R, do it for another R. This is called two-point correlation function. It is the excess probability of finding pairs at a certain distance R compared to a completely random data set. So you would end up with something like this. So this is the two-point correlation function, read S as R. So you would compute this xi, the two-point correlation function, at different radii R. And you get this two-point correlation function as a function of radius. For continuous fields, 
you can define something very similar where the two point correlation function is simply the correlation in the densities in the map for points that are separated by distance r. So you do this for all points that are separated by distance r. The Fourier transform of this is called the power spectrum. <laughs> And this is probably one of the most famous power spectra out there. This is the measurement from the Planck collaboration of the temperature fluctuations in the early universe. Okay. Uh, so this is L and instead of K, this is the wave number you have multiple moment L and the Y axis gives you the power spectrum. Okay. So why is the two point function or the power spectrum so widely used in cosmology? The reason is that if you have a Gaussian random field, then the two point correlation function or the power spectrum is the complete summary statistic. If you know what the information that lives in the two point function, the field or the map itself has no extra information. Okay. Uh, now you might ask, what is a Gaussian random field? Uh, I don't want to get into the technical definition, but a rule of thumb is if you have a Gaussian random field, so this is the CMB, okay? Take all the red spots in your mind, convert them to blue, take all the blue spots in your mind, convert them to red, and ask yourself, can I tell the new map statistically apart from the old map? Okay. For a Gaussian random field, you cannot tell those two statistically. So our universe seems to have started off as a Gaussian random field. Even today, if you look at the universe and squint, then it looks like a Gaussian random field. So the two-point correlation function or the power spectrum has been so widely used in cosmology. Okay? And it has yielded us all the great advances that we have made in the last 20, 30 years. But now, as our data becomes more precise and more exquisite, this no longer holds true because now you can see the universe at a resolution where it no longer appears as a Gaussian random field. So this is a zoom in of a region of a simulation. Now, if you try that trick, if you convert every over density into an under density and every under density and into, uh, into an over density in your head and compare the two maps, you would be able to tell them apart. Because then you would see very small under dense regions and very large over dense regions, which is in contrast to what you really have. Yeah. So, on small scale, the universe is not lost. Cosmological, cosmological surveys will provide very good data precisely in this region. This is where you will have the highest signal to noise, actually. So, we will fail to fully utilize the power of the uh, experiments. If we do not look for summary statistics that can throw the non Gaussian information in the field. So, the correlation function and the power spectrum cannot probe the non Gaussian parts of the information. It only looks at the Gaussian part of the information that leads to it. So, the question is how do we extract the non Gaussian part of the information? Okay. And we really have to do that to make full use of our cosmological surveys. <laughs> Uh, not for small uh, size or resolution. It could be real in data. In terms of primordial or Gaussianity, like of course, yes. So that's what I'm saying. Whether it's a absolutely due to the small size of your data or it's really there. No, small size I mean on small scales. Yes. Even if you start off with a Gaussian random field, no bispectrum, gravitational instability will drive due to a non-Gaussian region. It is absolutely true that even if you start with an initial primordial bispectrum, same thing will happen. Now you have to ask the question, which parts of the non-Gaussianity were generated by gravitational collapse and what is coming from the early universe? Absolutely. In fact, I will point out that uh, whatever summary statistics I talk about can be a very good tool to probe primordial non -Gaussians. Okay. So I hope I've convinced you that we have to go beyond the two-point function. And what do we 
expect of any new summary statistics that we propose. Okay. So these summary statistics, of course, should capture as much information about the data distribution as possible. Importantly, they should also be computable in feasible time on the data and many instances of theoretical predictions. Like I said, we have to make many theoretical predictions, see which one matches data the best. So this new summary statistic, you should be able to compute in reasonable amount of computational time on both sets of objects, data and data. This is actually quite important. What we will not talk about too much today is that we should also be able to model the effects of experimental systematics on these statistics without introducing biases. Uh, this we can discuss if anyone is interested in after that. So these are the set of desirable features that we want from our summary statistics. At the same time, since a lot of people are playing this game and proposing new summary statistics that go beyond the two-point correlation function, Another useful thing to understand is what are the underlying theoretical connections between various proposed summary statistics. Okay. Why this is important is that will allow us a quantitative, quantitative comparison of the information content in each of them. Which of these statistics should I apply to which data set to get the most information and to make sure that there is no you know, effects of systematics which somehow biases one statistic, whereas the other one is unbiased. So if you have multiple probes, you are less likely to make an error. Okay. So understanding these theoretical connections between these different common statistics is also something I will talk about at the end of the talk. And personally, I find that very fun. Okay. Okay. So what are the summary beyond Gaussian summary statistics that have been proposed in the literature? So I told you about the two-point correlation function. You can generalize that to an n-point correlation function. The simplest of the n-point correlation function is, of course, the three-point correlation function. So instead of pairs in the data, I look for triangles. But immediately you will realize that the triangle is characterized not just by a single length scale, but you need at least two length scales and an angle or three length scales, depending on how you parameterize the triangle. You compare this to similar triangles in the randoms, and you see how many more such triangles you have. That is a measure of clustering beyond the second one. Uh, of course, this has information, but as you go up from three point correlation to four point correlation, it becomes increasingly more difficult for you to compute it on the data. Okay? It becomes a, a computationally very challenging problem, and you cannot go beyond the four-point function. So there is a natural sort of truncation in this hierarchy. Another summary statistic that people have proposed is called the one-point PDF. What does this mean? So again, you have your discrete data points all over your volume. You basically throw down spheres of radius r randomly all over this volume and ask what is the probability of finding n data points in the sphere that I threw down. Okay, So you throw down all the spheres, you compute this probability. So for example, if I this is from the old SDSS data, if I throw down spheres of radius, let's okay, let's look at this one, 24 megaparsec. And I ask how many galaxies do I see? I get a probability distribution that looks like this. It peaks at around 120 galaxies per in 24 megaparsec spheres, but it is a distribution. Now, as I change this radius of the sphere that I throw down, I will get different types of distribution. So if I throw down spheres of radius 12 megaparsec, I get a distribution which peaks at around 20 galaxies. If I throw down spheres of radius 6, most of the spheres will have no galaxies in them. Only a few of them will have many galaxies. Okay? Again, you can show that this, in, this whole PDF is of course sensitive to the entire distribution and not just the width. The width is actually the Gaussian part of the information. So this is a very good summary statistic. The only problem is 
for each new radius, you have to do the computation again and again. So you can't use the computation you did for six megaparsec to tell you the answer for 20. <laughs> then there are these things called the Minkowski functionals, which are sort of geometric and topological measures of cluster. So the idea is the following. You have these four data points. Okay? Around each data point, you start growing a sphere in 3D or a circle in 2D. As the spheres grow, initially you'll have exactly as many spheres as the number of data points. But as the spheres grow, they will intersect with each other, creating these complex figures. What the Minkowski functionals tell you is that there are d independent Minkowski functionals for d dimensions. So, for example, in three dimensions, if you measure the volume, the surface area, something called the integrated mean curvature, and the Euler characteristic of these figures that form, that is a summary statistic of the clustering of the data. Okay. So for example, in this plot here, what they have plotted is how the volume vary, volume divided by 4 pi r cube varies as a function of the radius of the sphere that you draw, the surface area as a function of the radius of the radius of the circle that you draw, and the Euler characteristic, how it varies with the radius of the circle. So interestingly, you can see that when uh, the Euler characteristic initially should be four times some factor. Okay? And once all the spheres have joined up, then the Euler characteristic should be, depending on your convention, it should be either one or zero. Okay? If it's periodic boundary conditions, it's zero. If it's not, then it should saturate to one. I think they have assumed periodic, so it's zero. But here, before all of them merge, there's a hole in the middle. So it should actually be minus one in your chosen units. So you see the other characteristic went negative. So by looking at the change of the volume, area, et cetera, et cetera, Euler characteristic, you can tell exactly what the distribution of points were. Okay, so this has been proposed again many years before. So this D dimension is the is 3D. It's three, it, so in 2D, it will be 3, uh, sorry, I should write D plus 1, D plus 1 independent. So in 2D, the 3 independent will be the area, the, uh, circumference. the circumference, the perimeter, and the Euler characteristic. In 3D, it will be the volume, surface area, integrated mean curvature, and the Euler characteristic. Okay. That means in D dimension, there will be D plus one, plus one independent variables, which will give us the geometry of those geometry and the quality of, of, of the things combined. On. Exactly, of the shape that is formed at that particular radius. You change the radius, you have to compute all of these again. So you track it, how it changes with radius. Exactly. Okay. So this is the context. Now I will tell you about the summary statistic that we proposed a few years back called the k-nearest neighbor distribution. In fact, some of you may remember what I said last time, but I did introduce this. So I'll just quickly go over what this summary statistic is. Okay. So suppose you have some volume over which your data will live. You first sample the volume density with a set of query points. Okay? So you can just throw them randomly all over your volume. These darker points are your data points. What you do is you go to every query point. You ask how far is my nearest data point? How far is my second nearest data point? Third nearest data point? Fourth nearest data point, etc. And note it down. By using something called a tree structure, this can actually be done very quickly in n log n time. So it's not time consuming at all. You go to another query point, again, you ask the same set of questions. How far is my first nearest data point, second nearest data point, third nearest data point, and so on. Now, once you've done this for all the query points, you choose, let's say, the first nearest uh, distances for all the query points. You simply sort these distances, and that gives you the cumulative distribution function of the distances from any random point in your volume to the nearest data point, okay? 
So this is what a cumulative distribution function looks like. Always starts from zero, ends up at one. Your second nearest neighbor, similarly, you can ask what is the cumulative distribution function of distances to second nearest data point. So you'll get something, third nearest, fourth nearest, and you can continue. Okay, so what the takeaway is that a single measurement procedure is sufficient for a range of scales. I could use this entire thing by doing one set of operations. Okay, I did not need to redo it again for different equations. And as I said, this is not computationally expensive. A uh, data set that sort of represents a small cosmological data set takes, takes 20 seconds on a single code. Okay? Whereas for the same thing, if you wanted to compute the three-point correlation function, it would take you hours. So this is really fast. And I claim, this is my summary statistic of clustering. Okay? We will put this to test later on in the talk. Okay, So this is my claim. This is a very good summary statistic. Just to give you an idea of what is going on here, uh, consider two data sets. One in which the data is very clustered, and the second one where the data sort of lives randomly over this entire world. So the CDA will only reach one at a distance much larger than if I did the same procedure here. Because no matter where I am here, there is some data point that is relatively close to me. So how the CDA goes to one is very sensitive to how the data is actually clustered. Okay. So that's, a, that's one intuitive way of understanding how the information is being captured. Now, the good thing about this nearest neighbor way of thinking is that it also tells you how to do cross correlations between two different data sets. So what does that mean? I have two sets of data, say red galaxies and blue galaxies. Okay. And I want to ask, are the, are the fluctuations in the number of red galaxies and blue galaxies correlated with each other? Okay, are under densities in the red galaxies the same places where there are under densities of blue galaxies or no? <clears throat> to do that, we have to make a small change to our procedure. So now, along with the query point, we have two sets of data points, the green points and the blue points. So we again sample the volume densely with a set of query points. For each query point, we find the distance to the nearest data point of each data set. So I look for the nearest blue point and the nearest green point. I simply take the larger of these two distances. Okay. Go to another query point. Again, repeat the same procedure. Choose the larger of the two distances and create the cumulative distribution function of that. Okay. Again, I claim that this is a very good summary series. Okay. Again, to just give you a flavor of why this measures correlation, think of what would happen. If the blue and the green are completely uncorrelated and you are sitting somewhere near a blue data point, you are a query point that lives near a blue data point. If the two sets are completely uncorrelated, your nearest green data point can be any distance. It is equally likely to be close to you as far away from you. So, if the two sets are uncorrelated, you will get very few measurements for which the larger of the two distances is a small number. However, if the two sets are correlated, if you are a query point that lives near a blue data point, you are very likely to also be very close to a green data point. So the larger of those two distances is itself a small distance. So as you can see, this is what happens when the two sets are uncorrelated. This is what happens in the CDF when the two sets are correlated. You get lots of separations that are very small. And here you don't get them. So this difference from the completely uncorrelated case, I claim, is a very good summary statistic. What I think you can separate separately the progresses from the red and 
This is precisely the product of the two. Completely disjoint product. Yeah. Exactly. So if I measured the first nearest neighbor distances to the green and the first nearest neighbor distances to the blue, and I multiplied those two values, I would get this. That is what happens when they're completely uncorrelated. It, it works out very beautifully in the algebra as well. Uh, I'll get to it maybe slightly later. Ah, uh, it is larger because that answers the question: What is the probability of finding at least one of green and one of blue? If you choose the smaller one, it would be the answer to or. And and you can show is a representation of the joint distribution. I don't want to get into that till then. Uh, there is also a way of computing cross correlation between a discrete data set like galaxies and a field. So it could be like a weak lensing map like I showed you right in the beginning. Again, we have a procedure for that and we simply compute what fraction of query points have data points within radius R and the map density, which we are trying to correlate with, when smooth on radius R around that same point exceeds a certain threshold. This threshold you can set to be some percentile of all densities at that radius r. Anyway, again, we have a procedure and a summary system, which is here. Which so here now, again, you so down the query points, yes. you ask what is the nearest neighbor distance from each point. So in the discrete map as well as in the field. No, in the field, there is like that. So you do one of them. First, look at the discrete point. Yes. And you ask uh, what is the distance to my nearest neighbor data point. Now, the summary statistic is the following. At a particular R, the value of the summary statistic is the fraction of query points whose nearest neighbor data point is less than R and that same query point, if I draw a sphere of radius R around it, whether the enclosed density of the map exceeds a certain threshold. Okay. Now, as you can see that this is actually uh, responding to the joint probability distribution of both the map and the discrete data. And again, you can show, I'm not going to show this, but I'm going to uh, uh, give you examples where it proves that this proves the non-Gaussian part of the cluster. Yeah. So basically, I have claimed, I have three summary statistics, one for autocorrelation, one for cross-correlation, one for discrete field cross-correlation, etc. Now, they are all computable in very quick time, but the test is to show that when I apply it to data, I get much more information than if I use simply the two-point correlation function. So we have applied this to a bunch of different uh, uh, data sets in cosmology, and I'll walk you through some of them. So in the first one, this was led by a PhD student at Stanford, Richie Wang. We looked at the thousand richest SDSS red mapper clusters, okay? Now this is thousand clusters in a huge volume, okay? Many gigaparsec cube. So this is an extremely sparse data set. Even though the clusters are very clustered, measuring a two-point function is a sort of a challenge. So this is a plot of PDF versus chi-square. Okay. This is the chi-square distribution when you make the measurement on completely random points, thousand completely random points. So the spread of this chi-square distribution is a measure of the noise, right? If you measure the two-point correlation function on the data, you get this red dashed line. So there is a signal. So it is separated from the distribution of chi-squares for the null hypothesis. But this might be three sigma, I don't know. Who can do chi by algebra? Chi-square, I don't remember. This might be three, three sigma, I, I'm listening. But we apply this KNN formalism to the same data set. Again, you get the same chi-square distribution. You, you actually expect there to be the same chi-square distribution for null data, right? You shouldn't see a signal here. But with the same number of degrees of freedom, the data, when you analyze using the KNN method, 
gives you a chi square that lives here. So if this is three sigma, this must be at least five point something sigma. Okay, so again, this was the same data set analyzed once using analyzed once with the two point correlation function and once with the KNN. So we showed that there is much more information in the KNNs. What we were also able to show is that the data is not consistent with being drawn from a Gaussian random key. This we can show using the consistency relations between first nearest neighbor, second nearest neighbor, third nearest neighbor, and fourth nearest CDFs. If they are all connected by a Gaussian random key, there are certain consistency conditions between them. We showed that it is violated in the data. So this is not coming from a Gaussian random key. So this is highly nonlinear, highly non-Gaussian. But that should be able to get it from any other statistical like what? Not the two-point correlation. That three-point with thousand data with thousand data points, you will not be able to measure the three-point on this. It will be just be noise. Okay. Right. So that is why this is an important thing: is that if you try using three-point or four-point correlation functions on this data, you would simply get noise. Then we applied it to DES weak lens maps. So these are continuous maps. In the SDF example, we were dealing with discrete data. Here we were dealing with uh, uh, continuous map. Again, we were able to show this wasn't the full cosmology analysis. All that we did, we did a Fisher analysis with the with the measured signal to noise. Instead of doing a full analysis, we just looked at how much the constraints would improve if we did the two-point correlation function, which is the power spectrum, compared to our CDS, which is this one here. So in every case, you can see your constraints on various parameters like omega matter and sigma a would tighten by more than a factor of two if you used the KNN CDF way of computing. This, this one here. So here. Because the are also for all these So the original one is this, where we haven't even drawn the error ellipse. Where the error ellipse, sorry, is the purple one, is much, much wider than what you would get from using the CPLs. But then uh, one thing that, uh, because you know, if I see the extra omega in W, the, the field check key changes, right? Exactly. That's exactly. Get a different kind of uh... the degeneracy is different. Uh, so actually, then it tells you you should combine the should actually combine the power spectrum. Then it becomes com become complicated. Exactly. Exactly. So if the tilt changes, you should ideally combine both of them as long as they are not giving you completely different answers. Okay, that will have to wait for a full analysis because here we are doing Fisher. We are simply asking given the increase in the signal to noise that we are measuring on it. So the signal to noise is actually measured on the DES data. We have asked how much is the uh, error bar going to shrink because of this increase in signal to noise. What you are asking, when we do a full analysis, then we have to check whether we can combine the power spectrum and the CDF measurement. Uh, this is another application that is currently being done by my PhD student, Ishika. So, one of the things on the horizon is 21 centimeter mapping, which will map out the density of neutral hydrogen in the universe out to very high redshifts. Now, because of certain uh, systematics, it's very difficult to measure the auto clustering of 21 centimeter. However, people have tried to measure the cross correlation between 21 centimeter maps. This came from China. So Canadian hydrogen uh, uh, mission with samples of galaxies, which answers the question of what sorts of galaxies does this neutral hydrogen actually need? So what we did was using the Elastis TNG simulations, we put in realistic amounts of noise to mimic the, uh, the chime instrument and foreground filtering that is expected uh, that we need to do. And we try to see whether the 21 centimeter galaxy cross correlation signal gets stronger if we use the KNN formalism. 
So here again, you'll see a lot of these chi-square plots is the distribution of chi-squares for both the KNN measurements and the two-point correlation function measurements. They line up with each other. Blue is the signal that people have already seen. And this red one is the signal that we expect if we use this nearest neighbor sum of these statistics. Again, this is, so this is a log plot, by the way. So this is around 100. This is around 400. So again, you would expect roughly a two sigma improvement on whatever detection you get. And what is even more interesting is uh, the second study. This is the fiducial result we have. Here we showed that if for some reason in the future, we have to be more aggressive in cutting out the foreground. So this is something that people are dealing with. 21 centimeter uh, measurements have this foreground problem because our galaxy is so huge and so bright in 21 centimeter. The cosmological signal is actually very subdominant to it. In the future, if we have to be more aggressive than expected uh, to cut out the foregrounds, the signal to noise in the point really shrinks a lot. The KNN is actually very robust to this. And the reason is that it measures not only the two point cross correlation, but all higher order cross correlation. And it's very difficult for the galaxy to mimic all order cross correlations at the same time. Okay. So that's why we think this is a very nice result. And then finally, we also tried uh, to do galaxy cross non electromagnetic uh, cross correlation. So this is galaxy cross gravitational wave sources, galaxy cross high energy neutrinos in ice cube. Uh, both of these came out. A couple of weeks back, one is led by my master's thesis student, Kostu. Another one is also by an undergrad at Wisconsin. Both of these did not find a signal. However, we were able to show that as the data improves, as more and more gravitational waves are detected, the KNN cross correlation method will be the first one to detect a signal. Okay, so instead of waiting for 30 years, you have to wait 10 years. Okay. Uh, so this, what this is really trying to do is ask whether the gravitational wave events live in particular types of galaxies. So right now we are doing a very broad brush thing where we cross correlate with all galaxies. In the future, as the data improves, we want to cross correlate with particular types of galaxies and see if the cross correlation is stronger with those types of galaxies as opposed to something else. That would mean that they live preferentially in these types of galaxies. Uh, also, I think how this is just data cluster of gravitational wave sources. So, what is the source sample size? 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. 36. Uh, you can try to estimate which K will have the most information. Here, typically, we we have tried with K four eight etc. Uh, so the highest we are talking about is only the four. We have tried up to four. We have tried things like one two four eight two four six eight. Uh, mm -hmm. With these data sets, I, I, what Vithavan was saying is it turns out to be the most important point that the localization of the gravitational wave is so bad. Even with the in other cases, in other cases, one is always informative. What you add seems to saturate at around six to eight. So, for example, if you go to ten, you don't see much more information than you already see with six or eight. Don't see the sense that your signal noise is getting poorer. Like is not improving anymore. Like in yeah. case of three point production yeah. function. Of exactly. Yeah, but for example, the big depends really on the distribution of your data set. And maybe in six, seven, it saturates and then you can't extract exactly. information. It depends on how how complex and how big how non Gaussian your data is. How non Gaussian your data. Okay, so uh, there are some future directions I will go over this very quickly. You want to look for more exotic signature set is primordial non-gaussianity of Tova early universe physics as Shomu was pointing out. 
So we did look, we did a pilot study on this last year. We have some initial results which show that this KNN method is actually quite promising, but this is yet to be applied to data. And then we have to investigate the optimal method for modeling the signal if you really want to do full cosmology. Okay, so at the level of DESI or BOSS or whatever. Okay, so these are things that we are working on. The last few minutes of my talk, how, how much time is that? I don't know when I started. I think you have, you have five, five, six, ten minutes. Oh, I will try to In the last few minutes, I will yeah. talk about. How much the spoken is shown in the city to me? Ah, okay. So eight more minutes. Okay, yes, yeah. I'll try to wrap it up. So in the last few minutes, I will try to talk about the connections between the KNN statistics that we have proposed and what people have already done in the literature. And this part I actually find to be quite fun. I will get to the fun part. So one of the uh, summary statistics that I told you people had proposed many years ago was the PDF. Just to remind you, the PDF was the answer to the question at a radius r, if I throw down spheres, what is the probability of finding n galaxies in that? Okay. Now let us look at it from the CDF perspective. From the CDF, at a particular arc, all the query points, so if I if I'm at this arc, this tells me how many query points have a nearest neighbor data point within distance less than or equal to r. That is simply the value of this CDF. So at a particular R, all query points whose one and n data point is at distance less than equal to R has at least one data point in a sphere of radius R. It can have more, right? So there's no more. There's a chemical the one board Then you can erase this one. No, not no, that one. No, no. This one. This is the board. This one. This one. Yeah, okay. okay. Slide you can write. So if this is, for example, a query point. And this is the nearest neighbor data point. And I'm looking at some radius r, which is larger than this distance. This query point may have just one, but it should also have another data point here. So all I can say is that at a particular r, the value of the CDF is the probability of finding greater than or equal to one data point within radius r. But similarly, at that same r, the 2NN CDF tells me the probability of finding greater than or equal to two points within radius R. So if I take the difference between the two, that gives me the probability of finding exactly one data point within radius R. But I can generalize that same logic and say that the probability of finding k data points at radius R is simply the difference between two adjacent CDFs. So that is your PDF, one point two. Yes. So the act, you choose an R, you just subtract two adjacent lines, and that actually gives you the PDF. Okay. So that is the first connection. So from the KNN CDFs that we proposed, how do we connect to the PDFs? However, remember that for the CDF, only one measurement gave me all of these values. So I can get the PDF at whatever radius I want. I don't have to make a different measurement. Next, there's a connection between the KN and CDFs that we proposed and the endpoint correlation function. This one is slightly algebraic, it's not very intuitive, but if you try to write down the generating function for these CDFs, you can show that they can be written in this exponential form, where in the exponential, you get a sum of all of zines. What are these zines? These are nothing but integrals over the connected endpoint function. Okay. Uh, so this is some, something you know the literature as a cumulant expansion. Either way, each of the CDFs that we measure, the first nearest neighbor CDF or the second nearest neighbor CDF, can then be written as different combinations of all connected endpoint functions. This is yet another way of understanding why the KNNs are so sensitive. They are actually measuring combinations of all endpoint functions in the data. Oh, and I want to end with uh, this last few slides, where I want to talk about the connection between the nearest neighbor distribution and the Minkowski function. So this is some work that is being led by my current master's thesis student, Kwame. So remember the 
Minkowski functionals we discussed. You have data points, you grow spheres around them, you measure the, radi uh, the, the volume, the surface area, mean curvature, and the Euler characteristic. Okay. But now, with this data set, let me ask. So I computed my CBFs also, okay? At a particular radius, where are the points that contribute to my CBF at that particular radius, okay? So the CBF went like this. So at this radius, I can ask, where are all of these points okay, that contributed to my CBF? And they look like this because they have to lie within a certain radius of the data point. So this is in 2D, but in 3D, these would simply be spheres growing around the data points, just like the first Minkowski function, which is just the volume. So the first Minkowski function of order volume is simply the value of the CDF. It's nothing else. If I change the radius, I get spheres of different radius growing around the data points. Okay. So the CDF, the value of the CDF is precisely the same information as the first Minkowski function. What was the second Minkowski function? The second Minkowski function in 3D would be the surface area of this growing figure. If I go to my CDF and ask between R and R plus DR, the points that contribute to the growth of the CDF between these two points, where are those query points? And the query points are here. What is this? Again, this is 2D, but in 3D, this would simply be the surface area times DR. So if I divide by DR, I get the second Minkowski function. But what is this quantity? This is the change of the CDF when I go from R to R plus DR. So from this, what you understand is that the first derivative of the CDF is the second Minkowski function. And its geometrical interpretation is this surface area. Now, of course, now that we have started thinking along these lines, something must happen with the second derivative. It turns out that the second derivative is indeed connected to what is called the mean curvature, but the mean curvature is slightly more difficult to think about intuitively. So I'll give you a different pictorial description. So the second derivative, so the first derivative tells us about these parts. The second derivative you can show is sensitive to the points which are equidistant from two nearest neighbor data points. And those are the same points where the spheres will intersect at a particular R. So if at a particular R, I keep track of all points where the second derivatives change abruptly at any radius less than that R, I get this. Okay. This is at a particular R. Now I will change that R, make it larger. And I get this. And does anyone know what this is actually called? This is called the Voronoi tessellation of this. Okay. So the second derivative of the CDF is actually intimately related to how you draw a Voronoi tessellation of the data. And then, very interestingly, here I will not show it to you on actual data, but rather going spheres around these three points. So Think of these as your three data points, okay? I am changing the radius at which I'm computing the CDF. I will plot the value of the first NN CDF here and the value of the third derivative here. This will be second uh, nearest neighbor CDF, the third derivative of that, third nearest neighbor CDF, and the third derivative of that. Okay, let's see if this works. Okay, initially, you'll see that I simply have three spheres growing. The one and then CDF is growing. Importantly, the third derivative is completely constant. Oops. Oh, 
Okay. Now, as the spheres grow, they will at some point start intersecting. Okay. So you see these two spheres have intersected and immediately where is the discontinuity in the third derivative of the 1n and CDR. Again, there was this merger and then this merger. So there were three discontinuities here. Okay. Now, this shape should actually have an Euler characteristic with the whole in it. Okay. So it should actually be minus one. And you will see that the third digit will try to saturate here. And then as you let it run, it will finally go to zero. So what this is actually telling you is that the discontinuities in the third derivative of the one in and CDR, okay, exactly tells you the Euler characteristics of the shapes that are formed. So, putting all of this together, the 1n and CDF and its derivative have intuitive and very beautiful geometrical and topological interpretations. And they connect directly to the Minkowski functionals, which have been known in the literature. However, all the Minkowski functional connections are to the 1n and CDF and its derivatives. As we have, as we were discussing, there is actually information in other KNNs which is not in the traditional Minkowski functionals. So these are intersections of intersections, which are typically not taken into account in the Minkowski functional. And then the last two slides, and I will not spend any time on this at all. I think I'm obligated since I'm doing cosmology and astrophysics to say machine learning and AI. Uh, but as you can imagine, people are trying to use machine learning techniques to you know, sort of capture the information in the field. One of the problems with discrete data and sparse discrete data is that techniques like convolutional neural nets don't work very easily on this. Because if you try to create an image out of this, you would get lots of zeros and then ones at these locations. Okay? Convolutional neural nets don't work very well on such images. So people have tried to solve this problem by using, say, graph neural networks or even more recently from point clouds, okay, point cloud networks. But what we are uh, tackling with occlusive category who that I have is whether there is another way of creating a continuous map from this data and then feeding it to convolutional neural nets. Okay. And this is sort of uh, inspired by our nearest neighbor measurements. So for the nearest neighbor CDFs, what we did was we measured distances from query points and then sorted them. The process of sorting actually removes the information about where the query point itself came from. What if I instead created a map where I met, colored every query point by its distance to the nearest neighbor? You would get a map that colored. So for example, this color, would mean that this particular point is very far away from the nearest neighbor. So I just colored it by the distance to the nearest. I would get a map like this. Now, why is this map useful? Because this map is actually truly a continuous map. It is every point has a well-defined value. It is differentiable and differentiable infinitely many times because there are no uh, discontinuities anywhere. A convolutional neural net would be able to process this much more simply. And uh, unlike point cloud networks or graph neural networks, be which become more expensive the more data points you have, this does not scale like that. So, this is the map as colored by first nearest neighbor distances. You could also feed it maps colored by the second nearest neighbor distances. Okay. You can already see more features. So, what we are planning to do and from the initial results, they look very promising, is do cosmological constraints using these maps. Okay. And already we are competing with some of the best constraints that are out there, but all of this is preliminary, so I don't want to get into too much detail. So I will end here. So just this 
this is a good point, but in the summary is that summary statistics are fundamental to effectively answering physics questions from cosmological data. Uh, powerful beyond Gaussian statistics are the need of the hour to fully exploit the exquisite data that will come to us and is already coming to us from current and future experiments. Amongst these uh, summary statistics, the one we have proposed, the k nearest neighbor distributions are fast and powerful. They can take into account both autocorrelations and cross correlations. We can talk about discrete continuous data, everything within that same framework. Many interesting directions to explore. So applications to different data sets. So you know, whatever cosmological data set you might be interested in, finding the clustering or, or its cross correlations with, you can try this method. We are working on modeling and extracting cosmological parameters. That's a more long-term goal. Uh, there's a lot of fun to be had in understanding the connections with other uh, summaries in the literature and the initial sort of machine learning uh, forays that we are doing. So those are the fun parts. So uh, I'll stop there and take questions. Okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, the first thing is that uh, the number of heavy points we take, uh, is that sensitive to the data that we have or? Uh, uh, so you are really trying to answer this particular question. <laughs> You're trying to get very good measurements of the volume average probabilities, okay? For that, you need to sample the volume fine. Now, it typically turns out that as long as you're in the regime where the number of query points is like an order of magnitude more than the data points, you are safe. But depending on what signal you're looking for and so on, you also have to be careful about that. Suppose it's a very coarse grade signal, like I just want to detect clustering, you might be able to get away with 10 times as many. But if you wanted to do cosmological parameters from that, you might want more precision and you might have to adjust. Uh, so that will depend from case to case. I don't have a universal answer. And uh, the second question, uh, basically, uh, that is, uh, continuation of that. So when we are cross to correlating uh, any uh, discrete uh, map with a continuous group, so in that case, it, the problem becomes even more difficult, right? Because the uh, continuous map has way more query points and then, uh, in, uh, sorry, the, uh, it's a very uh, well defined map and then you probably need a lot more query points to actually get out of so again, uh, the, when I say continuous map, you would still need a sort of a graded version of that, right? Now, typically you would use say 1000 cube grid points or something, but 1000 cube query points is very easy to handle these days. The same amount of uh, memory that you'll need for the 1000 cube grid points, you need for 1000 cube query points. Uh, it's roughly a few gigabytes. So put it on a cluster, it will run immediately. Other questions? Well, it's kind of related to what I was going to You said that uh, for a little three point correlation function, that's the same thing. But uh, in your case, what is the signal to know? How do you uh, quantify the signal to know? So the, so the signal to noise is precisely these, these plots. Right. So this, I'll wait, let me wait for them to get it. <laughs> you can see. Huh. So forget about what uh, measurable I'm talking about. Whatever measurable you take, you have to characterize. If I didn't have clustered data, with pure unclustered data, what is the distribution of chi-square? Let's say my uh, the likelihood is Gaussian. Okay. So then, okay. yes. I can compute my chi-square as my data vector transpose times the covariance matrix inverse times the data vector. Now, if in place of my data vector, I put in completely unclustered data, that 
and for each realization, I plot the chi square. I should get if the likelihood is indeed Gaussian, an actual chi square. So the distribution of chi squares should be a chi square. Then you measure. Then you put the actual data vector into the same time frame. You look at the value. You ask what you can now summarize this plot is as either what is the p value, probability to exceed whatever you want to do. You can also do effective sigmas. That is what we are calling the signal difference. So at what sigma will you detect this given that the chi square distribution? at what kind of sample size or you know what should be the density of your sample in the survey where you actually gain uh, because after all to, it's true that your 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 case statistics is good but you know to be safe is so simple and uh, i agree yeah. so now, so okay that one of the reasons we chose this sample is to one is that it's very sparse so we want to show up the power of our yeah. statistics. However, the thousand richest cluster will also be extremely clustered. Yes. So they will actually be the most non Gaussian right. clustering that you can get. That is where you will have much more information beyond the 2.4. Yes. Yes. Now, increasing the number density then serves two purposes. One is that the number density is increasing, so it is no longer sparse. And the second one is so you are no longer looking at the most biased parts of the universe. You're looking at more and more sort of the average universe. Of course, in the average universe, it is not that clustered if you look at large enough scales. And therefore, there won't be information beyond the 2.4 function. However, even if you look at large scales or uh, different sizes, the two point correlation function will never outdo this. It will, be, it will end up being roughly the same information. So I'll show you an example here. It is very difficult to see on this screen, but this line actually has two things on it. One is the original measurement of the power spectrum. And the second one is our measurement of the CDFs on a Gaussianized map. And so the match is so close, you can't see. So, so if you had a completely Gaussian yeah. data set, then the KNN would give you precisely the same information. And the, so we tested this very, very thoroughly. So that means we have to understand that the KNN is most powerful when you have to deal, deal with in detect non Gaussian. Exactly. So exactly. that's why the endpoint correlation exactly. comes in the. So we can even probably see that in uh, the human. Generating function that is oh yes 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 so algebraically function, let's say it is purely Gaussian huh. absolutely probably your will actually reduce to some uh, combination yes. of the PCR itself oh. just to be part lost the yeah ah. this one yes yeah that one actually in our first paper we have a section on what happens for Gaussian oh. field and we worked everything out analytically and showed that you get precisely the 2.3. And the second task, second question is that, okay, the second question is actually related to what we briefly discussed, that as you said that the power of your KNN case, the case KNRS liver statistics is actually looking at the locality, but as we know that in large scale structured data, we have like two kinds of non locality as you said, in the initial condition, then why you have nonlinear clustering? So, so, and you said that you can make that distinction. <laughs> what is the way to go for that? So, we, how do they understand that these Gaussianities, non Gaussianities are coming from different? No, uh, that's why I said this is a pilot study. I won't say we have identified, okay, like this part comes from primordial and this comes from. 
what we have done again is a sort of a Fisher study where we look at, we kept all the other cosmological parameters the same, the H over the same. And very, we, in one case, we put in a little bit of primordial number of So we tried different local equilateral or problems, etc. We varied only that and saw the response to the K. Then we opened up the HOD direction and tried to figure out can HOD confuse us? And the answer seemed to suggest no. But what is the unique signature of primordial non Gaussianity compared to non Gaussianity that is generated by gravity, like you said? I don't think we have a clear understanding of that. So that's why I said this is promising, but there are many things to understand. Have you tried this in the CMP paper that came in? Ah, so yes. So uh, Emmanuel Shan, who's at Slack now, he wants to try it, but we actually haven't. Yet. We actually were thinking more of the secondary CMP. Yeah, that also done. Yeah. Even the primary. Yeah. Primary CMP also people talk about little bit of normal yeah. Secondary has other issues. Yeah. Other questions? No, I have a few questions. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I am a little puzzled by the choices you made for those two studies, the gravitational waves and the high energy neutrino sources. What was the expectation? I mean, even if you had good data, I mean, what kind of uh, what population do you expect? Or ah. do these sources are okay. So, so for high energy neutrino. Uh, of course, you know, many of us think that the answer is yes, but the question is, what is the source of the extremely high energy neutron? Right. Is it extra in the first place? If you can show any cross correlations with galaxies, then that is, that is an answer to the question, what is the origin? Then you can make it more refined, but for that you need very much better data. For example, are they coming from blue star forming galaxies? Are they coming from uh, galaxies with blazars? Then you would try different samples and look at the degree of cross correlation. So For this, you would need the cross correlation down to pretty small scales. But then for these, how many samples you have? Again, in the yes. range of hundreds right now. Uh, this is ice cube. Hundreds. 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 And even there, the localization. Localization again is very bad. And this is energy of the PV for what? The PV. PV. So for this one, uh, one of the things that my student is currently doing is trying to see if, you know, the, how much will addition of LIGO India help with the localization and whether that will be crucial to uh, getting a detection in the next year. Right now, the answer seems no, but yes. But the neutrino can also be water. Once again, it has to get into, you know, maybe order 1000, then maybe yes, auto clustering. And also the localization. Localization is, but neutrino, we don't expect the localization to improve. Much. Don't. Yeah. How can you localize the neutrino? With gravitational waves, at least you, you know, if you keep adding detectors, you might. Assume that it gets better. For neutrinos, I don't think. Okay. Any other questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker again. And uh, I just forgot to say that we have uh, Professor Dukankar home today. I mean, you, you all met him during the SSD talk. It turns out that Professor Home uh, was a long time collaborator.